So I'm starting. Yeah. Are we calling this something? I don't really know. Uh, I think basically you know that I'm Ethan and that she's Kat, and we're here to answer your questions. So <laughs> is this really how you're starting it? <laughs> how else would you start this? I don't know, but. Well, we're going to try and answer your questions once a week on YouTube. Now, these questions are brought from all of our platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. We've polled, ask for your questions, and now we're here to answer them. That is a really long title, but let's go with it. I got a question from Tustin Yarger. Sorry for all of the butchering of your tags, but... It was on Instagram. On Instagram. How far do you let your dogs range out while you're hunting? Um, it's a great question. There are a lot of answers to this. The range of your hunting dog is going to depend a lot on cover and what you're hunting. If you are running in big, wide open country, for example, the grasslands of the Dakotas or Montana or Wyoming, any of that short uh, sage, prairie, whatever, you can, you're gonna need to let your dogs run a little bit bigger because you've got a lot of country to cover. Uh, if you get into thick woods like the grouse woods, typically dogs are gonna range closer. And cattails of South Dakota, you're gonna yeah, want them to be South a little Dakota, bit closer. A lot of times you're gonna have dogs closer. So as far as what is an actual yardage, um, that all depends on what you're hunting. Now, it also depends on your dog because we're referring to pointing breeds. Correct. If you've got a lab or something like that, you're definitely gonna wanna keep them in gun range so that when they get birdie and they make the flush, you have an opportunity to shoot the bird. So there's a lot of variables in there and it really depends on what you're comfortable with your dog and how much you trust them to hold point and not overpressure birds and that sort of thing. And that is the last part of it is, I am not going to let a young dog probably run as far because I don't trust them to hold point as long and so on. Where our seasoned dogs, I if I'm hunting quail or even sharp tails, whatever it is now, I let them run pretty big. So to answer your question, multiple parts there. Um, range is gonna depend on cover. It's also gonna depend on the type of dog you have, flushing or pointing dog. And then your overall trust in their um, ability to do their job. Next question, thanks, that was a good one. Next question is from Facebook, Jason Gainley. I've got a quick question, whistle or no whistle while hunting training? Never see you guys use one in any videos. Well, that's a good question, and we like to handle fairly silently uh, with the dogs. We communicate a lot of times with them via the e-collar. If I feel like my dog's getting out a little too far, instead of hollering and shouting and whistling at them, I'll just use the vibrate. That lets the dog know, hey, I need to pay attention. Look, oh, there's my handler, and that'll a lot of times make them check back in. Uh, but we like to handle more quietly than hollering all the time, as well as if it's really windy, like today, we were out training, super windy, those dogs aren't gonna hear you whistling, they're not gonna hear you hollering um, if they're out at any good distance, so. But they are gonna be able to feel that collar. I would say that as far as whistle or verbal, the big thing that we do use that for is if the dog can't pinpoint where we're at, um, saying their name or whistling or something to that effect, making noise to draw attention to where or who is actually calling them. But like Kat said, most of the time, we silent handle and talk to the dog with the collar. Next, a question off of Instagram from at Nate.Rees. Is it okay to shoot birds that your dog doesn't point? If I bump the bird, can I shoot it? Absolutely. Now, we have heard and I have heard over the years, a lot of people say, I'm here for the bird work and the dogs and the everything. I only shoot birds at my dog's point. That is awesome. But not everybody gets the same number of opportunities to hunt. And in the long run, it doesn't matter. I mean, the only thing that I can caution you about would be if you actively watch your dog lock up on point, pounce, flush the bird with no handle from you or anything, that would be a bird that I wouldn't shoot. Everything else, shoot it. Um, the more birds that you can get in front of your dog, the more, uh, the more experience that they're gonna gain. And the only thing that I would add to that is, 
If you've got a young dog and let's say it's their first season on birds um, and they've had minimal exposure and training prior to their first hunting season, birds getting up willy-nilly that the dog hasn't worked and you're just blasting away, especially if you haven't done a proper birding gun intro, could potentially cause issues because your dog's not associating the gunfire with the bird if they didn't see the situation happen. So just watch your dog. Um, I know that this can happen a lot of time with quail hunting because coveys flush and it's overwhelming for a dog and then a single gets up later and the dog didn't even see that hap that bird get up and you go to shoot it and then they're like, whoa, what was that? Why is there shooting going on? I didn't even see the situation happen. But for the most part, it's not gonna cause problems if you've done proper training and exposure with gunfire yep. proper to hunting. As long as you hunting. aren't shortchanging your dog before going to the field, shooting those birds should be no problem. Unless, like we said, the one thing, the dog actively flushes the bird, that would not be ideal if your goal is for them to eventually point them. Yes. Perfect, thanks for the question. Next question is also from Facebook, from Nathan Dean. What's the best way to teach calm expectations and calm energy inside the house? I have an eight month old puppy now, but he tends to get bursts of energy inside and becomes a handful. That's, That's a, a really great good question. Question. Um, it's actually asked a lot. A and lot, a lot. Because we work with high energy breeds for the most part, uh, short hairs, pointers in general have a lot of energy. Um, we need to make sure that we are having calm expectations, like you said, in the house, and that includes like what Ethan's mom always says, take it outside boys, when they're getting too rowdy, so. Yeah, we weren't, we weren't allowed to rough house in that. I got three, I have a, three other brothers and rough housing was not allowed. If we started getting too rough, we had to go outside. So inside behaviors versus outside behaviors. Outside, you can play, you can run around, be crazy, be wild, burn off a little steam. Inside, when you come inside, it's not bouncing off the walls, jumping over the back of the couch, ping-ponging around. It's very calm expectations. Heck, she used to just make us run around. She'd be like, run laps. three laps, go run laps around the house. And But it wasn't run laps inside. It wasn't try and find ways to entertain us inside. It was. Outside is where we burn off steam. Inside is where we are calm and don't roughhouse. And something that you can do to help um, instill those calm behaviors inside is you said your puppy's eight months old. It's a great time if you haven't started place training already to introduce place training, build up from clicker training to actually collar conditioning to stay on that dog bed. Then when they come inside or you're home from work in the evening and they're trying to be wild inside, you can say, hey, knock it off, go get on your dog bed. And once you watch their energy level come down a notch and they're more calm, then they can be released from their dog bed to mingle, hang out, come into the kitchen while you're cooking dinner, but not until that energy has worn off and they have relaxed being in the house. There's always those transitions of going outside to coming inside or coming out of their crate. Our dogs do it too. It's those transitions are exciting. And the dogs always think, oh, something's happening. Well, yes, yeah, something's happening. Now you get to go lay on a dog bed and settle down. Then you can hang out and be a calm, well-behaved part of the family. What it comes down to is conditioning. And if we can condition our expectations of these puppies, even though it may seem like I've got this wild and crazy eight-month-old, we're still talking about a, not, a very small period of that dog's life. And if you take the time to condition the behaviors you're looking for with that puppy, though some may be more trying than others, um, you're going to end up with a much nicer dog at a much younger age that's easy to live with. Yeah, but basically setting your dog up for success and conditioning the behaviors that you're going to want to see out of them as an adult is really important. You know, people make excuses for their puppies a lot and say, oh, well, they're just eight months old or they're just a year or oh, they're two and I still have a wild, crazy animal. Well, start having calm expectations for them now and <laughs> making sure that they follow those calm expectations so that at two years old or older, they're not just continuing to be puppies. Absolutely, great question. Next, we have Danny Franco 540 on Instagram. What is the best way to doctor my dog's pads that are beat up after a hunt? Any pre-hunt options? It depends on the level or the severity of the cut, okay? So if we have a terribly ripped up cut, you may need to go to the vet to get stitches or something like that. If you're just talking about worn pads or small cuts in pads, which can happen on running on rough country, like we get a lot of questions about, 
the best thing to do for them that I have found is to keep them clean. Any of the things that go on the pads to help them heal or whatever, I mean, a lot of times also softens the pad, and then you're being counterproductive. Your dogs are trying to build up calluses and toughness, and you're softening them with basically lotion-y type of things, and your dog's pads are never going to get tougher then. They're always gonna get torn up every time they go out in the field. Unless you're putting a cone on them or something, they can lick it off, or they're gonna be running around on the ground. So whatever it is, then stay in there or if you're gonna do pad wraps. I mean, it really comes down to severity. If it's bad, do what your vet says. They're gonna know best, they went to school for this. But what I can say is our dogs, uh, I don't use boots. Yes, I do hunt rough country, and I know all of you that say that it's not possible, it is possible. We do a lot of roading. A lot of roading on sand and gravel, and that toughens and conditions pads to the point where we have minimal to no issues. We run in West Texas, we run in the hills where there's rocks. Um, South Dakota where there's tough um, ice on the top of the snow and that ice um, can get really, really rough on the pads too. But pre-season conditioning and pre-hunt conditioning and in-between hunt conditioning um, to toughen pads and we do that through roading. I uh, can't stress that enough. We hook up to harnesses, pulling the four-wheeler running with the four-wheeler on our driveway or the edge of the gravel road if you've got a safe place to do that. That toughens pads, and if you have tough conditioned pads, you're not going to have breakdown like the average dog sees. I do see it though. I, I had a dog that came in and I said, I'm gonna take you hunting with me, and I had my dogs and this extra dog that wasn't conditioned with my dogs, and the first field, she ran her pads off. I mean, blistered up the big, the main pad portion on three out of her four feet were completely blistered and she was pretty much done. So I know what you're talking about, but it's also proof that the conditioning process works. Roading on sand and gravel is key to building the pad strength. Now, if you are looking for boots, I've heard that Lewis boots are good, and that's all I know. I've never used never them. Never tried them, so we can't necessarily speak to them, but that's the word on the street. That's that's the word on the street. That's what everybody recommends. One more question from Brandon Banton from Facebook. When collar conditioning to a known command, such as here, with vibrate and let's say a six and a half month old puppy understands the pressure on, pressure off with it, do you eventually move training sessions toward a true simulation at a low level and repeat the training process to here, or will the puppy correlate between vibrate and low level e-stimulation as far as pressure on, pressure off? So to paraphrase the question, if your dog responds to vibrate, in controlled situations, but not in uncontrolled situations, how and when do you move to using stimulation? Yeah, basically, I think that's what he was asking. Close. Great question. Something that has been asked a little more recently, um, as well as a lot of our puppy training videos that we've done in our puppy series hasn't really hit on this very much. Um, and so it's definitely something that we have talked about needing to do a training video of which I plan on doing with Legend this week because I had a situation doing his bird and gun intro today that he got his bird and then didn't necessarily want to come back with it. Bye-bye. Yeah, less controlled situation, even though he understands recall with Vibrate, he didn't want to bring the bird back, Vibrate wasn't enough, but I have not done any proofing with the collar, so I haven't switched over to using stimulation. And what we like to do is we call it proof the collar, where we go back to basically the same scenario as when we call a condition with vibrate, and we do that with low levels of stimulation in a controlled environment. We can build that momentum with vibrate, then switch back to a low level of stimulation on the collar, and then you do the same recall drill there. You want to do that in a controlled environment and not just throw that stimulation at them the first time that they're not responding to vibrate in a high distraction environment because they're not gonna necessarily correlate that vibrate is also the same as the stimulation and that it's a pressure on, pressure off situation. Dogs can act confused, they can freeze, they can flip out when they feel that depending on you know the dog's personality. So- And that's all the improper introduction, you basically tried to take the easy way out by just pushing the button without properly teaching. Yep, skipping steps, 
never helps you get there faster. So we go back to a controlled environment, introduce stimulation, and we gradually actually go up in stimulation. I don't just go to a one and go, oh, he listens on a one, perfect, I'm done. No, I do a one, then I go up to a two and a three, and I'm not trying to use too much stimulation, but I'm trying to prove that even if I need a little more stimulation in those higher distraction situations, he's still gonna respond properly. So we're gonna do a video on that because I think it's a really good question and something that gets overlooked a lot of times. So great question. Thanks everybody for watching. I'm sure we'll come up for some, we'll come up with an actual name for this series. But to begin with, basically all you need to know is that if you follow us on our social platforms, ask us questions and we will prompt you for those. Um, we're gonna select questions every week. Yep, every week we'll do a post saying, hey, ask us your questions. Those are where we're gonna pull most of these questions from. Um, so they're all in one place, Facebook, Instagram, stories and things like that that are easier for us to find when we shoot the video. But then you'll have to watch this video and find out if your questions were answered. Yeah, it's like a lottery or something. <laughs> Thanks everybody for watching and until next time, I'm the guy with the pink gun. And I'm Cat the Dog Trainer. Peace.